Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about how we can work with prejudice and bias that we have with other people. And when I talk about this, the way we view other people, I mean in the kind of the more um, irrational, subconscious bias and prejudice we have against other people. And rationally, right. consciously, I don't think anybody's, you know, different or worse than me, but growing up in a certain society with certain family, certain way, these things are just inbred in us that, you know, people of different nation, different look, different gender, or I view them in a certain way. How can me and others work with something like that? Very simple. Teach them primary point. If they truly understand this, all prejudice, all dualities will be gone. So then they can see a little speck of light in their minds when there is no duality and there is no judgment and no prejudice and nothing of that sort. If not, then show them the open, clear sky. So if substance doesn't work, then truth should work. And you can ask, in the sky, is there good or bad? Pretty similar to the sixth patriarch's question, when you do not think of good and bad, what is your original face? Well, if somebody understands this question, then it's very high class consciousness. Okay? And the third is function. If they don't understand substance, they don't see the truth, then just do together action with them. And keep the correct mind, the non-judgmental mind, during that time. If you do that, it will go through, but don't expect quick success. We human beings are famous for making our lives and each other's lives infinitely worse on this planet in record time. I mean, can you tell me any other species on this planet that started a world war? We already had two. And we consider ourselves intelligent. Congratulations. So keep one mind, keep clear mind, point out the nature of thinking, help people return before thinking. Then all of these dualities, prejudices, discrimination, everything disappears. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I read in uh, Zen Master Subong's Dharma Talks, he spoke about um, four gates in Buddhism. Sutra gate, um, Yombu gate, Mantra gate, and No gate gate. I was wondering if you could maybe explain those four gates. Let's start with my favorite, the No gate gate. <laughs> That's the Kongan. That's Don No. Mantra is what you chant inside. That can open up your mind too. Yombul is actually the kido or the mantra that, that you chant loud outside. Sutra is understanding. It's the books made by very faithful scribes and scholars based on the Buddha's and the patriarch's teaching. So you can do it by reading, chanting loud, chanting inside silently, or keeping complete don't know, and that's the help with the Kongan. Either way, it's four doors into the same room. To the mind, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. If you don't get there, then you practice it in the wrong way. If people are attached to the words of the books, or to the melody of the mantra, or to the words of the Kongan, then all this does not go back to unmoving mind. If we are attached to the method, we never reach the goal. There was an American monk, not in our school, but he visited Sung San Sunim at Huagesa, and he stayed in a fully Korean temple. Can you imagine? He spoke perfect Korean. He bowed better than Koreans. His manners were impeccable. And as an American, for, of course, he was first in the army. Then he changed his uniform and went to the Buddha's army. So he became a monk. After four years, he came to see Kunsunim 
and started to ask him a long question in perfect accentless Korean. It was like, what? A guy who looks like from Oregon, okay, speaks perfect Korean and the Zen lingo. Everything you needed, he had it. Sungjan Kunstunim was listening for about 30 seconds. In his book, this is a long time. And then he blurts out in English and he says, Attached to Wadu, cannot get enlightenment. And the guy got shocked. I mean, he thought he was the intelligent practitioner. And Sung San Sunim would give him this fantastically clever, magnanimous answer and this treatise about Huadu itself. Because his question was all about the great question. What am I or what is this? And he got shot with one sentence. If you are attached to the Huadu, you cannot get enlightenment. Full stop. That's a bad method. You don't use it, you don't get there. You're attached to it, you also don't get there. Happy? I hope so, because you, you don't get any more than this. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? How do you know that you are not attached, you are balanced, you follow the practice, but you are not attached to the practice or to the forums or to the mantra or whatever? Kongan interview, that's the test. So you come to see the teacher, teacher asks you a question, and if only form comes, some people sit beautiful like little Buddha. And I say, knock, knock, who's there? What's going on with you? I asked you a question. Not many times, but sometimes it happens. Or they're attached to substance. They just learned the hit, so they use my Zen stick. And, <laughs> and they expect me to give them the pat on the shoulder. And I'm waiting. It's only that? <laughs> then total loss. You know, whatever center they had splurged just into 10,000 pieces. More practice necessary. Okay. So, Kongan is the absolute killer. It kills all views of practice, yourself, the teacher, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, all preconceived ideas are dust. That's when real results come. I feel deeply grateful for everybody who preserved this practice and I'm trying my best to give it to the next generation. Because without this paradoxical, irritating, annoying teaching, which is so wise, compassionate, and supremely beautiful, we wouldn't stand a chance, at, at least not in Zen. The paradox paves the way to your intuition. Because nothing else can solve the Kongan, only your intuition. And of course, we have small Kongans, nice Kongans, easy Kongans, then middle-sized Kongans, more difficult Kongans, then the bitch, then the super difficult, then the killer, okay? Okay, that's it. That's why Sung San Kunstunim made this system. After the first four or five interviews, you believe you can do it. You're not even close. You didn't even wet your lips, okay? But you already believe, I can. No, that's most important, your self-confidence. Then you get to the real questions. And say, How did this happen to me? For the last six months, I solved everything, and now I'm totally at a loss. That's when your practice begins. Wonderful. Then you get to the real questions. And say, How did this happen to me? For the last six months, I solved everything, and now I'm totally at a loss. That's when your practice begins. Wonderful. So testing your mind is very necessary. Each tradition has its own way of doing that, okay? Zen has this one specifically, and just looking back to my beginning time over 30 years ago, first I thought I knew it, I was a smart guy, okay? No longer, <laughs> I mean, I can't remember almost anything. <laughs> but I remember how irritated I was when I really got to this killer Kongan in two years. I'm not gonna tell you what that was. 
I wanted to blow up the entire Zen center with everybody in it because I couldn't solve the damn thing. And I, what? How, how could this anger come? It's a question and an answer that I don't know. Just why do I want to destroy the whole world just because I didn't succeed? That's when you can see your self-image. Terrible. But I haven't seen any other tool, any other method that could so precisely and successfully get this out of you and put this before your own face without any human interference. Why? Everything happens inside. What happens outside is unimaginable. You go to the room, you bow, the teacher bows back. You pay your respects, the teacher receives your respects with gratitude. The teaching happens, it's a nice conversation. Then you get out, you start to sit again and everything blows up. Why? Because you didn't know the answer and your self-image got hurt. Fantastic. It hurts you exactly where it has to hurt in your ego. Nothing else matters. Nothing else hurts. Just your own self-respect. Your own self-image that I am supposed to know. I went through this so many times. I'm very grateful for that. So, the door is open. Tomorrow, interviews. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the relationship between trusting the don't know and trusting myself. Because who I've are you? <laughs> then same. <laughs> I didn't understand. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> In Zen, in the temple, you speak about putting down your opinion, not attaching to your opinion. And my question is, here in the temple, that works great. But kind of going outside of the temple in the world, we have to make decisions and we have to do certain stuff. And I mean, we work according to our opinions. How can we kind of function in the world and do certain things without attaching to our opinions and not having them? You other are in one opinions? of the cleverest cultures on earth. So you have tons of opinions coming right at you every moment. Two points. See the source of the opinion. Where does that come from? Opinions are immaterial, but the mind is important. That makes them. How can you help that mind come back to the truth without feeling interfered, disturbed, etc.? Next, find the truth yourself. Become free of anybody's opinion and based on that truth, relate and function correctly. Everything else is noise. Stay with the truth. Help others stay with the truth. Kindness and patience are your best friends for that. Don't follow people's opinions. Don't have opinions on opinions. Stay simple. Stay clear. If somebody puts on the wrong music, don't dance with them. <laughs>